Yeah, so 2023 has really been defined by three factors. And only one of those factors really matters uh, for long-term investors. And that's the structural decline uh, in the Chinese economy. Now, we know that China has a lot of debt. We know that China has had a, uh, an economic model built around fixed asset investment, and that's not sustainable. But the thing that's really changed uh, over the last 12 months is the collapse in optimism uh, around the future for Chinese consumers. So Chinese individuals are very pessimistic about the future, and that's a new dynamic. And so if we look at the data on consumer confidence, which is no longer published because it became so weak, uh, you know, it, it never recovered from that COVID zero period. And if we look in recent results, even resilient categories like cosmetics or beer uh, are showing big, big declines, even with those weak bases. So that's, that's a new dynamic in China, but it's unlikely, uh, it's unlikely to change in the near term. So that structural uh, deterioration in the outlook for the Chinese economy, that absolutely matters uh, for long-term investors and is one of the key factors that's driven uh, markets globally uh, this year. The other two factors, less relevant. The second one is geopolitical events. Now that is relevant, but the point is that's always around. This is an ever-present feature uh, of global markets now. We've moved from a unipolar world in that period, that brief uh, period after the, the uh, uh, Cold War, where the US was the only game in town. Now we live in a multipolar world. Uh, and that just means more geopolitical conflict. And it means more proxy wars, uh, and uh, you're gonna see constant uh, external shocks. And so the key there, and this, does, this is not particular to 2023, it's something that investors just have to live with, this is the new reality, is having a portfolio that's resilient to geopolitical shocks. The final factor that uh, uh, defined this year, which really long-term investors can completely forget, uh, is the Fed. We're living in a, a world that is uh, hyper short term. Uh, you know, it's, the market's just absolutely following uh, uh, the chairman's comments. What's the Fed going to do next? Every piece of data uh, driving markets. The fund's average holding period is more than four years. EM, we're looking at structural growth driven by these long term tailwinds like demographics, urbanization. Uh, structural penetration of financial services, telecommunication, health healthcare, and so on. And so what the Fed does next week really doesn't matter if you're investing for the long run. Uh, but that's grabbed a lot of headlines and it should certainly uh, fed into short-term uh, price movements of volatility this year. So I think, first of all, we see no more. The uh, US dollars peaked out, I guess. Uh, and so timing is very difficult. But I think we're unlikely to see significant further US dollar strength. It looks very, very stretched. So maybe we see flat US dollar or declining US dollar. And that means EM currencies are up. So I suspect that a portion of returns for EM equities next year is going to come from currency. Now we've already seen that in select currencies. If you look at the last two years, investors in Mexico have made money on both the equities and the currency. But I think you'll see that more broadly next year, uh, EM central banks have been much more proactive in raising the policy rate. Uh, and so there's good support for EM uh, currencies, which look very oversold and cheap, uh, to rally. And so currency should be a, a tailwind next year. I think the second thing we're going to see uh, is, a, is a global slowdown. Now, it remains to be seen whether the US has a recession or not, but certainly the Fed wants to slow the economy. And I think you see a global slowdown. So that means that uh, emerging markets that are very trade-oriented are probably going to have a tough year. Uh, now, the, the other side of that coin is that uh, emerging markets driven by domestic consumption, uh, that they're where you want to be, I think, over the next 12 months. So classic example there is India. Uh, another one's Indonesia. Uh, countries where it's resilient to uh, external demand and where you've just got this beautiful uh, internal driver of demographics. So for example, India uh, is forecast to grow 6% next year, 6% real GDP next year, and 6% real GDP growth the year after. Now that is remarkable uh, in an environment where the world's expected to barely grow. And that's where you want to have exposure. Indonesia is another example, as I said. Mexico is another example, that domestic, just domestically driven, um, resilient economies. So it's still Mexico's time in the sun. 
they are the biggest beneficiary of the structural deterioration in US-China relations. Uh, friendshoring, nearshoring, that's real. Uh, US, uh, uh, Mexico, that relationship is strong. And Mexico is just absolutely blessed. Right? It has excellent uh, infrastructure links with the US, wage rates that are 20% of the US. Intellectual property is protected. That was always a complaint with supply chains in China. Uh, with Mexico, intellectual property is protected, enshrined uh, by NAFTA. Uh, same time zone, very, very well placed uh, as the global supply chain rebalances uh, away from China. Short-term volatility is here to stay. Uh, there will be as uh, global geopolitical uh, uh, black swans. Uh, you know, when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, very few uh, experts had that in their forecast even three months out. So by definition, I can't tell you what the geopolitical shocks are going to be next year. Uh, but the key is having a long-term focus, buying companies that are resilient. You want to own companies, and certainly this is uh, our portfolio, which are net cash. If you have uh, significant borrowings and there's an external shock, the price of refinancing that debt goes up, and often you end up selling your prized assets are so at the absolute bottom of the market. Resilient companies in resilient countries. So again, countries that are driven by primarily domestic uh, demand rather than exposed to global trade. Uh, I think though that that subset will outperform. And I think you know people complain about volatility, but if you're a, an active manager, a selective manager, volatility is your friend because it keeps throwing up opportunities. You see uh, really good companies uh, sold off this, the market, when, when there's an external shock, gets very bad at distinguishing between the high quality companies and the weak quality uh, companies. And so there's your opportunity to buy, buy the best companies. And in the end, the earnings growth is what's going to drive the share price. And so that's why you want to buy the resilient companies, because the earnings growth, when, as soon as they report, share price recovers. But there'll be opportunities in volatility where the market is indiscriminate. And that's, uh, and that's, that's what the uh, long-term managers can do.